So a few years ago, I returned to the academic world after more than a decade away. Uh, and I came back to the university with uh, a topic which was new to me. And I approached this with uh, a set of assumptions, ideas, prejudices. And within a year and a half, my thinking had changed dramatically. And the idea concerns climate. Now, uh, I assume we all know that uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially from carbon dioxide, from the burning of fossil fuels, uh, will change the climate. That will pose risks for uh, humans and for the environment. So the, uh, so the ideal solution, of course, is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is what I call the central dogma of climate change. Drastic cuts in greenhouse gas emissions are needed to reduce climate change. But this is difficult. And that is in part evidenced by the lack of progress. Here we have a graph. This is annual emissions around the globe of carbon dioxide, the most important greenhouse gas. And you can see that it's been increasing uh, quite steadily since 1950. Um, and the graph is off-center, you may have noticed, because I'm going to zoom in here. This is the recent past, the near future, and going a bit higher on the uh, value of annual emissions. And here we zoom in a little bit. And what you can see here in the recent past is that the, uh, 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 the annual emissions have even sped up. But what I want to draw your attention to here are all these little lines that are shooting off the side. Since 1990, which is around the time that we've become concerned about the risk of climate change, scientists have been uh, creating possible scenarios of the future, and they keep revising them. And those are all these various lines shooting off to the sides. And what I see here is that actual emissions, which is the, the fat black line with the black circles, is closer to the pessimistic scenarios of the past than to the optimistic ones. So greenhouse gas cuts are difficult and it's not just because powerful vested economic interests like oil companies are getting in the way of good policies. It's hard in part because serious cuts in greenhouse gases are expensive now, keep in mind that um, future emissions are going to happen primarily in poor developing countries and that the burning of fossil fuels remains essential to economic development. To, so, to some degree, calls for drastic cuts in greenhouse gases is us rich people telling poor countries that they need to stay a little bit poor because of our past actions. Cuts in greenhouse gas emissions are also difficult because we would take expensive actions whose benefits would be spread out throughout the world. And these would primarily be concentrated on the far side of the world and in the future. So you can imagine that serious cuts in greenhouse gas emissions might not turn out to be politically popular. Now, because of this, there's a lot of people who are concerned that these cuts in greenhouse gas emissions won't be enough. So some scientists and some observers are thinking about more radical responses. They're considering possible large-scale intentional modification of Earth systems in order to counterbalance some effects of climate change. So these ideas are uh, sometimes called climate engineering or geoengineering. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus in on one that's the most talked about uh, to give you some, uh, 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 something, something concrete to visualize. But you need to know that there's a broad range of ideas. They vary quite a bit in what they would try to do, how they would go about it, what their capacities are, how much they would cost, and so forth. And the idea for this most widely discussed form of climate engineering comes from volcanoes. So it turns out that after large volcanic eruptions, the planet is cooler 
by about a degree Celsius for about a year. And that's because volcanoes shoot into the air tiny sulfur oxide particles which linger for some time, reflecting some of the incoming light from the sun back out away from the earth. That cools the earth a bit like uh, putting one of those gray reflective shields on your car's window uh, on a hot summer day. So now some scientists are thinking, well, what if we could somehow uh, get large quantities of sulfur oxide or a similar small particle into the upper atmosphere in order to have the similar effect, to reflect some of the incoming sunlight just enough to counterbalance the warming effect, the warming aspect of climate change. So here is a schematic of uh, how it might work. In this case, there's a, a, a ship out at sea, there's a large hose going up into the sky. This, this is up into the stratosphere, so on the order of five or six kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Uh, there's a hot air balloon, and it's uh, uh, spraying this material into the sky. Now, keep in mind, this type of thinking is really at an early stage. Uh, there's modeling work, uh, but there's no uh, field work. Nothing's being done outdoors yet. Let me give you four facts about these proposed climate engineering methods. First of all, it would be effective. This could cool the earth as much as we may ever want to cool it. There is not much scientific debate about that. The second fact is that it would be fast. The effects would occur within the matter of months after such material were to be put into the atmosphere. The third fact is that it would be cheap, on the order of tens of billions of euros per year, which on the one hand is a lot of money, but in the world of climate change economics it's almost nothing. And fourth, it would be quite imperfect. So to explain that, climate change will change both temperature and rainfall. And it will do this differently throughout the world. Climate engineering will counterbalance both of those effects, but it will do that differently throughout the world. So hypothetically, if we were to take global average annual temperature and reduce it back down to a pre-climate change level, there would still be warm places and cool places and wet places and dry places, and some of these abnormalities may still be quite significant. That's what I mean by imperfect. So, from one perspective, um, why would we do such a thing? Um, isn't this just putting air pollution uh, into the atmosphere in order to counterbalance the effects of another form of air pollution? And perhaps more important, would, wouldn't this uh, uh, undermine any political willpower that might exist for uh, cuts in greenhouse gas emissions? It's for these reasons that climate engineering proposals have been very controversial. In fact, until just a couple years ago, they were basically taboo. It was not appropriate to speak of them in the uh, climate change community. And still they're quite controversial. Uh, Al Gore, perhaps the world's leading figure in the fight against climate change, called them simply nuts. And the American environmentalist Bill McKibben uh, calls it junky logic. I think you can see what he means by that. I believe these concerns are uh, uh, understandable and they're appropriate, but I think they're misplaced. And this is where my, changing, my, my, my thinking changed dramatically over the course of my research. Uh, I'm an environmentalist, so I came into looking at climate engineering assuming that this was being promoted by, uh, by mad scientists who wanted big toys to play with and by oil companies and other economic interests who wanted to avoid cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. And that any talk of climate engineering would in fact 
hinder greenhouse gas cuts. Let me explain how I was wrong. No one who is talking about climate engineering research is doing so uh, with the intention, or at least with the stated intention, let's say, of avoiding these greenhouse gas cuts. They're not talking about living limitless. They're talking about this because they're scared. They despair that greenhouse gas cuts won't be enough. They think, well, while we're working on a cure for a disease, isn't it wise to treat the symptoms? Perhaps, in fact, this talk and this research into climate engineering will hinder greenhouse gas cuts. But the goal of climate policy is to reduce risks from climate change. And that's what I think will happen. I'll, I'll explain this a bit by way, by, by way of an analogy. It turns out that when the drivers of cars wear seat belts, they drive a little bit faster and they drive a little bit more dangerously. And because of this, they have a few more automobile accidents. But the net effect of seat belts in cars is a reduction of injuries and fatalities. And for that reason, seat belts are promoted and often required by law. Because after all, that's the goal of automobile safety policy, to reduce inj injuries and fatalities. If the goal were to be cautious driving, then seat belts would not be put into cars. In fact, some people have said, if the goal of automobile safety were cautious driving, then cars instead would be fitted with a spike in the center of the steering wheel, pointed right at the driver. I think we all dri would drive a little bit more cautiously under such circumstances, <laughs> but it may result in an increase in fatalities, and it would be confusing the means for the end. So, you can think about three ways that climate engineering might complement cuts in greenhouse gas emissions instead of substituting for them. First, it could buy us time. It could, t it could moderate the worst effects of climate change while we're doing research and developing technologies on, for example, green energy and methods to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Second, note that it's the rate of climate change that can be particularly dangerous. How fast does the climate change? Climate engineering could be used to slow down the rate of climate change. And third, note that climate change is both delayed and uncertain. And by delayed, what I mean is that the greenhouse gases we're emitting today are going to be the cause of climate change in the future. If the world were to somehow completely stop emitting greenhouse gases today, the climate would keep changing for about 50 years. There's some, yeah, momentum in the system, so to speak. And it's uncertain in the sense that scientists have estimates of how much the climate will change and how much the world will warm up for a given amount of greenhouse gas emissions, but there's significant significant uncertainty in that estimate. So if you put those things together, you could imagine a scenario where climate change might turn out to be much worse than we expected. And in such a scenario, climate engineering could serve as a tool which could be accessed in such an emergency. You can think of it as a type of an insurance policy. So let me start wrapping up. Climate change is real. It presents serious risks to humans and to the environment. But it is not the type of problem that is going to be solved with a singular solution. It is a problematic condition which is going to be managed through a number of tools. And at the top of that list is indeed serious cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. But I believe that climate engineering is another such tool, as well as adapting society and ecosystems to a changed environment. 
these would altogether be complements. You can think about this as living with limits. <sighs> Climate engineering has the potential, perhaps, to reduce these serious risks, but some environmentalists are confusing means for the end. When they're urging, and some of them do, no consideration of climate engineering and no research into climate engineering, they're saying something analogous to saying that cars shouldn't have seat belts because we would drive a little bit more risky. And in a way, they're saying that cars should be instead fitted with that spike in the middle of the steering wheel to ensure that the risks of climate change remain high as an incentive for society to do the right thing, which is drastic cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, those cuts may or may not happen. They may or may not be enough. And that is a risk that I'm not comfortable with. Thank you.